The music is English, the story Greek, and the theatre is Roman. Even more remarkable is the location, an ancient but little known capital. It's 300 years since Purcell wrote his opera Dido and Aeneas, and nearly 2,000 years since Bosra was the Roman capital of Arabia. Where Roman soldiers once gathered, tonight in the same seats, lovers of opera. It's the first opera to be staged jointly by a cast and crew from England and Syria. And it's all about international diplomacy. Not long ago, Syria was the country best known to the West as a safe haven for terrorists. But in the last few years, Syria has turned from Moscow to Washington, started talks with its enemy Israel, and has, ever so slightly, began opening the door to foreign investment. But even at the opera, it's impossible to forget that Syria is a one-man regime, held for more than 20 years in the iron grip of its president, Hafez al-Assad. We are uh, well aware that we have been blessed with a leadership that is uh, unique in the area. And we are sure that this leadership will get us to, to the shore of peace uh, uh, with the least uh, problems. Once it is there, I think we are ready for it. For centuries, Syria's stony desert was a highway. Once it was part of the old Silk Road. Even earlier, caravans from Mesopotamia passed through on their way to the Mediterranean. It was a trail from oasis to oasis, and its biggest way station was Palmyra. Romans called it the City of Palms. Trade made it rich, and Roman leaders made it powerful. All the caravans had the, 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 the stop here. The business took place here in the Agora. And its downfall came with the rule of the beautiful Zenobia. Defying Rome, she declared Palmyra independent. <laughs> let's, let's have fun in the bath of Zenobia. But Zenobia was captured and the Romans set fire to the city and massacred its people. Palmyra sank into obscurity. Now Syria's modern traders see new opportunities. A peace deal with Israel could turn their rich history into a prosperous future. Once we have peace that's comprehensive and just, I think the whole world would change its attitude as a, as a starter towards the area. Uh, after all, this area is full of uh, traditions full of uh, old history that people are interested in. In other words, some camel's hair is worth more money. Sure, there are. This year, at the peak of the season, every hotel in town is full. Syria is still on the United States list of countries that support terrorism. But even that isn't stopping the tourists from arriving in record, if small, numbers. We have been getting number one position Saeb Nahas is the man bringing American tourists to Syria. His tour group was one of the government's earliest joint ventures with a private company. Tourism is a backbone for our economy and for our foreign exchange revenue. Uh, Syria uh, has so many potentialities in tourism and you have all what you need in this respect. So you see uh, the 
tourism inflow to Syria from all parts of the world. This is gorgeous. Look at the like, seats uh, and look at yeah. the... Good shape. But for Syria, opening up to foreigners will come slowly. It's a revolution that's calculated and cautious. In Syria, change is slow and the past is powerful. Damascus claims to be the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. A centre for Romans and Christians, Damascus expanded with the coming of Islam. Its mosques date back to the 7th century. Even today, its prayer callers are famous. In the oldest city, the oldest meeting place is Cafe Nafara. For hundreds of years, Damascenes have gathered here each evening after the prayer. Before radio and TV, there was coffee, water pipes, and storytelling. Once popular in cafes from Marrakesh to Baghdad, the street poets handed old books and traditional tales from father to son. Now Abu Shadi is the last storyteller, or Hakawati, in Damascus. Every night, he draws an enthusiastic following, from university lecturers to labourers. It's the tale of a 13th century slave who fought the Crusaders and Mughals. Everyone knows the story. Whipping up the audience is part of the art. The slave defeats the invaders. Today, in the era of Middle East peace, a new kind of invader and their foreign currency are welcome. You may leave all things that you don't need in the bus, so jackets or things that you don't need for sure. By the year 2000, Syria hopes to earn more than $2 billion a year from tourism. But so far, Westerners are a minority. Would you please put the bag over this uh, cover, over this cloth that you are uh, putting on? Tighten the head cover quite well to cover the hair completely. Put on the sleeves and tie it up. After At the Umayyad Mosque, one of the Middle East's the oldest air. and most beautiful, yeah, tourists, yeah. especially Americans, are still something of a novelty. Say, I am 13 years old. Oh, it's nice to meet you. Until recently, Syria was almost totally isolated. An ally of Iran, it was seen in the West as a backer of Islamic fundamentalists and a sponsor of terrorism. The vision of ordinary Americans in the black robes of Islam was almost unthinkable. For Westerners, covering up like this will probably be one of the most memorable images of Syria, but it's only a part of the picture. This is a country that's incorporated the contradictions of socialism and Islam, is almost totally Muslim and has yet remained relatively secular. It's been a successful but brutal balancing act. 
The government's only real political opposition came in the 1980s from the Muslim Brotherhood. The army crushed it almost immediately. So it isn't surprising that the government's first economic changes have also been the least political. When it came to loosening control, the government turned to a small group of businessmen it trusted, men like Saeb Nahas. And Syria, with her political stability since 1970, have generated economic stability, security stability and social stability. And it is well known that these are the first important elements for the tourism industry. But caution, driven by fear of losing political power, has forced gross inefficiencies on business. In the Nahas Empire, this factory is a throwback to another era. When a cash shortage forced the government to surrender its monopoly over food production, it passed a special law allowing joint ventures in agriculture. But even with joint management, the result is outdated machinery, massive inefficiencies and little growth. Syria doesn't have a stock exchange, and there's only one government bank. All investment still has to be funded from outside the country. Of course, it would have been much easier if the banks are here. Uh, I do hope that uh, this problem will be solved in a way or another. Syria's politicians may be talking tough about a peace deal with Israel, but the quieter reality is that Syria's businessmen are already preparing for new competition and new opportunities. Peace in general uh, is very good for all the countries concerned. And I'm sure that uh, everybody is to benefit. Uh, allocation of resources, uh, uh, the new trend uh, towards more uh, constructive business. And this is what everybody knows and everybody uh, is very serious about. <laughs> The 90s should be a new era, but so far, to most of Syria's 15 million people, economic liberalisation has brought little change. The old trading town of Palmyra could benefit from peace and more tourists. In the long term, increased trade and a smaller army could leave more money for roads and water, education and health. But Syria is in no hurry for change. It's a place where even big businessmen weigh their words carefully, where economic reform won't necessarily mean political freedom. Thousands of years, Syria's been conquered and invaded. All the great civilizations have been here, the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans. Now the old empires have gone, and Syria's influence and location have left it at the heart of the modern Arab world, the country holding the key to peace and the Middle East's future. Syria is opening up, but slowly and cautiously, fearful that economic liberties will result in demands for political freedoms. A broad Middle East peace may well be inevitable, but Syria is in no rush to force the pace of history.